Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to have you here, and I am thrilled that there's so much, there's so many of you that were crowded, and shortly before you know it, the building in the next building over will have big ceilings and wide space, and there will be so much room for everybody that will be able to have three times the number here. And that's um, what I was hoping because our art talks have been very exciting and the artists who have been showing here have just been fantastic. You've come today for um, a talk about the exhibition called Common Threads. It's a fiber show, and we don't have that many fiber shows, but this one is a real beauty. We have a variety of people who have shown here before, and we have a couple of people who have never shown here before. So um, I'll start by I'll start by uh, first talking about um, Michael Cummings, who is the quilter, a few other artists, and then um, the artists will speak to you about their process, and you'll be able to really have a, a full understanding of what this show is about. Um, one of the artists who is, not, who is not here is Michael Cummings. Michael Cummings is a quilter. He's in many, many, many museums and private collections. He talks about in his work, he talks about the black experience, and not only in America, not only uh, the cultural things that we've been hearing about, about racism and things like that, but he also is very interested in telling the story of, of Jamaica and Haiti and what life is like in these places. There are four of these quilts, and you'll be able to um, see them when we when we finish. Another artist who is not here is Nancy Buetti Randall. She's actually a painter and she has um, started with some paintings that she's then cut up and has done a lot of linear work on a sewing machine. So that's how she came to be here. There are some others in the um, back entrance that you can see. One was started with cut up paper and the sewing machine, and the other started out as a monoprint, and then the linear work was added on the sewing machine as well. Um, let's see, who else am I missing? Odell Plantin, um, I thought she was coming. She is the woman that does scarves and silk work. She does the technique of shibori which means that you tie it, fold it, beat it, stretch it, dye it, and do all sorts of things with it. And her work is in the middle room. And Beth Carney is um, a quilter as well. We have three of these pieces in this area here. And her work is a little bit different. And I was very interested in having the comparison of techniques between Michael Cummings and Beth Carney. So now, let's get to who's here. I'd like to introduce Pat Solon, who does the felted dolls, and she will be talking about that. Sally Shore, who has done the center um, island in the next room, and that is called Literal Fragments, and she will tell you all about that. Sally's work has been here before. She is a ribbon weaver and does a lot of different things with felting, fabric, ribbon, thread. Very beautiful work. Justine Moody um, has done this felting that's over there for now. Also, the scarf she's wearing and one that I'll put back on, it was too warm. <laughs> um, and is also does uh, ceramic work and many different kinds of crafts. She'll talk about her process. Fernanda Vargas, who is an expert in batik, having lived in, um, where did you live? Indonesia. In which place was that? How many different places have you lived? Oh, yeah. That's She's lived in many places bef besides Indonesia, which is where she 
um, learned how to do the batik. And then Marsha Widener, who has done those uh, beautifully um, crocheted dresses out of knitted. knitted and has three pieces over the jewelry section. And so she'll be talking about that. Um, I'd just like to say that um, I, I think that my work and the changes in my work over many years is kind of guided by falling in love with the material and then trying to figure out what I can do with it. And I'd also like to say that Gallery North gave me my first show in about 1984 when I came to work at Stony Brook Hospital as a social worker and I came up with some collages and nothing on my resume except a, a salon de refuse from, from, the, <laughs> from the Huntington Art League and, and got into a two-person show. So I have many, many happy feelings about, um, about Gallery North. Um, I love fibers and paper, and they're mostly linen fibers and flax fibers and paper. Flax equals linen, actually, as it goes on further. And um, I was very fortunate to take a class at Donay in the city many years ago, the paper making place, and I just love making paper. And um, I... Um, particularly like making very thin paper, uh, which is what some of what you see here with the um, pieces over the, uh, over the jewelry place. Um, it's flax paper. The pulp is beaten a long, long time, and you get a very thin, sli slightly translucent paper, and it has a lovely crackle to it. Um, the dresses, however, are made of paper that I did not make. They are, it's Japanese uh, paper yarn that um, I think I discovered it from another artist. And um, when, I, when I got it, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And then there was a show up in Boston which was called Blue, and I had some blue. And I knitted the blue dress, uh, my Alice blue gown, and that kind of got me going. And uh, I have another dress that's all black. But, um, and one thing about knitting stuff is that um, I could, um, I had a husband who was more or less at home for a number of years, and so I could put my knitting into a garbage can, a garbage bag, not can, and come home and sit and uh, listen to TV and knit. So I could do two things at one time and still be with my husband. And that made a lot of difference to me. And uh, I also like to do work with fragments of things, collages that have little bits and pieces of things, cloth, paper, old stamps. I like old things, too. And uh, so I just kind of hop from one thing to another. Uh, and... Um, this, what's actually here in, the, in this is brand new work that I just had started doing. So kind of go, I, and I go backwards and then I go forwards and try something else. And, uh, but it has to do with just loving the materials and wanting to make something of them. And uh, so that's where I'm going. Thank you. What I think we will do is have everybody um, present, and then we can ask questions at the end. And Odell is here as well, so you'll get the discussion about Shibori the, oh. as well. well. Oh, one other thing. I, I brought a bunch of old postcards from my shows, and you're, you're welcome to, uh, to keep one if you like. But they'll show you a wide variety of my work, which is, this is fiber over glass casting shadows, and uh, that's a collage. I did a lot of nests. I was into nests quite a bit. And then here's a nest that's made out of steel. I did a little welding. 
And anyway, I'll pass these around. But I don't want to take away from somebody else's speech by doing that. So, you're going to talk a little bit about the tea? During the two years that I lived in Jakarta, I learned a lot about classical and ancestral batik. And basically, they, they repeat the element a lot, which is something that in our culture sometimes we see as repeating or repetitive. For them, they are like honoring their culture, and they are talking about their roots and their beliefs. So after I left Indonesia, I had to put away a little bit of batik because I had my children then, they were babies, and this is what I work with. I have two or three of these. It's like stove with hot wax. So batik is a way of printing cloth where you put wax where you want the color to remain the same color, and you keep adding dyes then. My two pieces are the hammock and the chair. They're both done in a different way. I, I've been kind of changing the batik uh, because it's fun to, you know, try dif different things. And when, uh, when Gallery North approached me and talked about this textile show, I've been in other shows, but usually I've been with painters and, and people that do installations. And I, I, it's the first time that I'm in a show only fibers. So I figured that I had to do something special for this show. I had other pieces, but I thought, no, this time I'm, I wanna do something really different. And I decided to use uh, Indonesian elements, that's what you see there, in, in, um, in Brazilian textiles. I'm Brazilian. So I decided to kind of honor my roots using the way Indonesian honored theirs. And I also like to change things. I think I lived in 10 different countries. Every move was like, oh, this chair doesn't work here. You have to do it differently. Tablecloths don't work in that same table anymore. So past eight years, I had this pile of curtains that I didn't use anymore. So I, I kind of used that. So that piece is a hammock that was a hammock in my house. And now it's a hanging. And the chair, I use a Brazilian cloth that was actually a tablecloth that was new and good, perfect thickness to do a chair. So in the, I brought here some, so you'll understand a little bit, that the cloth of the chair basically was this color, green with a square white. And I put wax, I applied the wax where I wanted to keep the green. I also do a series of studies to, to find how I'm going to use this. So this, is, this element is like, they call chiplock. And in Indonesian, the chiplock elements are, are a series of repetition in like grades or, or circle. And uh, you see, I was trying to see how I would use colors and shapes with the square thing. So I, I will put the transparent paper to kind of find out. I took a picture of my tablecloth. And um, yeah, so these two, the two pieces have the same line of element, the chip lock that talks about the four directions, uh, you know, north, south, and west, and east. And uh, the Indonesians believe that if you had something like this in your house, it will bring you prosperity. So I thought it was a good time to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here, if you, I, I'll leave here later if you want to take a look. They talk about the chip lock, and basically, they are, this is the, the egg shape that I use in the hammock, and they are done with stamps. And of course, I mean, they have bigger than this, but I decided to explode with my drawings. So I did all by hand, though, uh, hand meaning circle by circle. And the tools that I use are, uh, to, apply the wax. I use the, the Chinese brush and this, super thin. So I do the, the beginning with this and then I, I fill it with that. And uh, so it's kind of a very time cons consuming work and kind of meditative. You stay hours on that. It's really, I love it. So I'll be doing more work where I'm going to use the stamps. I have many of them and I'm going to, you know, change the way they look. So, 
Yeah, so another, just a little detail, I brought this one too, so you can see, this is all done with stamps. This is an Indonesian cloth. I usually keep them for my classes. And um, the chair, I basically, that's what they call the classical batik, where I apply wax and I use the red, and then I remove the wax. So I had already all these different shades of green that gave me these different shades of brown, red. But the hammock, I didn't dip it because physically I don't have space for that in my studio to, to dip a whole hammock in a, in, a, in a tank of color. So I use sprays and brushes. And if you go there, you'll see the peach, peach color, salmon color will meet with red, with blue that I, I've been applying with sprays all on the ground and big brushes, you know, that I kind of mix it. And uh, it's very exciting and uh, like, nerve breaking, you know, you have to, you have to do it and it's like, oh my God, but it's just so good at the end if you see that thing, it's kind of an artist thing like that, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, basically that's it. My name is Justine and I'm a felder. Um, let's see, I went to Pratt as a painting uh, major and painted for a long time and when I had my children, I decided that painting with varnishes and turpentines and probably not the best idea while I'm nursing and having my babies around is totally toxic so I opened a knitting store and I worked with hand dyes. I was hand dyeing, I was spinning and um, I decided uh, to become more involved with raw natural fibers so I started ordering and playing around with um, loose merino and silk so all of these pieces here are made with short fiber merino and um, merino has these microscopic barbs on the edges of them and when they are applied in three different directions so horizontal vertical horizontal and they're sandwiched with agitation and water those barbs get intertwined together so they're not woven but they're now fused together through pressure um, I loved the way the merino is renewable it's a natural resource. Um, we can change it to become three-dimensional. We can wear it. It's a craft form that goes back to the beginning of time. And I love history, and I love the history of it, and I love that it's, a, um, it's an age-old technique that can be uh, transformed into such modern pieces um, and things. You can use them. You, I mean, I have baby dresses. You're more than welcome to, at the end, even go up and feel it. It's so buttery soft. Um, the fabric, the fibers that I use for this, these pieces are um, short fiber merino, which means that the long tufts, the hairs are very long and merino. These are uh, piled and chopped and piled and chopped, and they become, um, they're put into batting. So I'm able to lay them down in different layers. I use multiple resists on the pieces that have these sculptural holes in them, which means that in between the layers of the fibers, I put uh, these foam boards, and then I layer it again so that those board, the boards don't let the fibers glue together. Then toward the end of the piece, the process, keep in mind these shrink about 25 to 30 percent in size. So they start big and fluffy and then they become compact and small. I cut those resists out and I'm able to really sculpt, which is it's one of those things about working with merino and silk and natural fibers. You can really um, change the orientation and sculpt with it. And there's just something so, you know, as a felter, enamoring about taking this, um, these raw natural fibers and building something tangible with them. Um, uh, in 2010, I lost my husband, so I decided to close up shop and take my two small babies back to Long Island, and I started felting full-time, and it was very um, therapeutic, like you said. You get lost in it, and you, you just work for hours, and, you know, you don't even... You hardly come up for air sometimes. And you're so involved in a piece. Yeah. But I love the element of surprise and the depth and, um, and 
what you can do with carbs. And I love teaching. I teach here. Um, I do a lot of felting workshops. I'm going to be doing some silk dyeing workshops. Um, the same uh, aspects of felting I, I really love about doing pottery. Um, again, it's a raw natural resource that you can change and transform. Um, we're working on building a pottery studio here at Gallery North, so hopefully I get to share the craft with all of you guys. And that's it. That's all I have. You want to switch spots? I'm Sally, uh, the ribbon weaver, but I do I brought ribbons, but not uh, woven ribbons. Um, the literal fragments that we have out on the platform in the other room um, came about because I was using these wired ribbons for an installation I did, um, which was a recycling project to, um, to say, publicize the fact that the wastewater treatment plant in the Maranek had accidentally dumped 30 million little wagon wheel pasta plastic discs, bio discs, into the sound, and they had washed up on a lot of the North Shore beaches of Long Island. I went to a beach cleanup, and my friend and I at the end, another artist, said, we have to make artwork out of these discs. So they're, they're about that big, and they're plastic, and they're about half an inch thick, and they have little sections in them, and I decided to tie them together with ribbons and make a habitat like a gyre floating on the ocean with seaweed growing off of it. And my friend used her discs to um, make the scales out of fish that she was, not out of fish, on fish. She was crocheting with plastic bags, which she cut crosswise and looped together to make a yarn. And she crocheted a five-foot-long fish and used the discs as the scales on the fish. So while I was tying up these discs to make this habitat, which we have now shown in two venues and we have a third coming, um, I said, I love these wired ribbons so much, I have to do something with them that's for me, that's artwork, that's not about this recycling of trash. So um, lying on my table, they look like grasses along the coastline, and I decided to, um, to make literal fragments where the imagination is that I cut out a section of the edge of the pond or the stream with the grass growing on it, and I hung it on the wall or placed it on the table. So the wired ribbons represent the grasses in winter, spring, summer, fall. They change colors. Um, I didn't get too literal with some of them. Some of them are not real grass colors, but you'd be surprised what you can find. Um, a friend of mine sent me a picture from a, a show that she went to in Colorado of grasses, <laughs> just photographs of grasses that were exactly the same thing that I was doing but they were real grasses, so um, that's pretty much what I have to say about it. I, I used painted painter, I, painter's panels. I painted with um, acrylic paint. Um, they're meant to be painted on. And I tied the ribbons onto hardware cloth and then glued and stapled the hardware cloth to the panel so that they don't fall off. The ribbon in lots of different colors, and I still have a lot of them. I tend to do more. There's about 48 in the series right now. Um, and I'm going to keep going with that. Other than that, I paint, I weave with ribbon, I do felt work, um, both wet and dry felt. It's quite cool. Um, I do bead work, which is another weaving technique, bead weaving techniques. Um, I knit and I sew, and now there's other fiber things. So I have lots of different stashes and ways to do it. You want to stay over there because I'm just yeah, I have all my stuff over okay. here. Okay, leave it there. Okay, oh, my name is Pat, and I really sort of came to my process in a very roundabout way because I've been a painter all my life, but until about 2003, but I, things sort of led up to me getting involved in fibers, although I've always sewn all my life. And actually, I went to the Maryland Institute for Fashion Design, and then I graduated from Stony Brook with a fine arts and art history major. But to make a long story short, I ended up working down at the Visual Arts as assistant to the fine arts chairman. I was supposed to take this printmaking class and got canceled. 
so I took a class in textile design. Ended up being a textile designer for 23 years in New York City. And I freelanced most of the time. I worked staff a few times, but I didn't really like it. So I've always been painting, sewing, and other things. But then I think I was taking a little hiatus from the textile world. And I thought, well, because I was sewing, I thought, well, I went over to St. James. It was this little quilting store. And they had some nice fabrics, and I hooked up with some of those gals there, and they were quilting, and then they were making dolls. But in the meantime, I had gone to North Carolina, and the Folk Art Museum there, there was this figure, and it was by Kira Blount. Now, she is a very well-known doll artist. She's since passed away. I wish I had bought it then, because I can't buy it now. <laughs> but I was so enthralled with this piece of work. And I came home and I remember talking to my husband. He would say, what do you want to do that for? And I said, hmm, you know, it's just you know, something different. Meanwhile, I'm still painting and sewing and, and I did go back to doing design work. But in the meantime, I kept doing these dolls and I kept going to different conferences. I went to one down in uh, Maryland and my husband asked me what I wanted for my birthday. And he gave me this conference which was in September, only he died in May. But I went anyhow. And this was the beginning of my career. <laughs> and this was probably the first piece I did. Now this was in, this was a man, I know people, some of you may remember the quilt fairs down at the uh, pier in New York. And they were run by John Darcy Noble and he was head of the Folk Art Museum. But he was teaching this class. So I took this class, and this was the piece that I did. Now, this is all made from paper and paper clay. This was the first one, and I did that one. Then I got on this whole big kick, and I did a whole series. And these were all my male figures. And actually, these were in a show here a few years ago. And I think it was called Works on Paper. But, uh, and, that. and then at the same time I'm doing that, I started doing these things. <laughs> so I'm sort of like all over the place. Meanwhile, I'm still painting. And actually, I was doing some design work at the time. I was working for a friend of mine in the city. But then I, was, uh, then I did these for a while. These are all my own original designs, but these were, the poor guys got twisted like, but most of these were done for challenges, and this was like for an insect, so here's my insect, my green mm. insect, so, 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 you know, I kind of get carried away here, you know, just stick them there, then I did this one, when I did this, this, actually I did this one before that one, and someone said to me, well, I think you're more interested in costume design than doll design. I said, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> so then I took a workshop with this woman whose name is Deborah Pope. And she did felted figures. But hers are different than mine. She does beautiful work. But she does more characters, you know, other than the gallery things that are here. This is the first one I did. This was, this is called the cat and the fiddle. This was done for a challenge for a nursery run. And in the bag is, it jumped over the moon. So, this is my, this is my doll, I don't sell it. <laughs> and then, this, this is called Sweetie. This is a strawberry. <laughs> And I just want to give you a little uh, history of where I'm coming from. So now I find that I mostly do this. I still do some painting and some photography. And, you know, I try to sew, but I sort of run out of time. But this is how it starts. This is a piece I'm working on. I'll just leave that right there for now. But I do tend to work with themes, but not consecutively because I find that my work takes a long time. I'm usually talking. I think this cat 
took about three months for me to do. But my work, even though it's felted, this is how I start. This is just like, I think this was going to be a snowman. But this, but this is just the basic beginning. And this is just batting. So what I do is sort of get an idea how big it's going to be. Try to keep it small, which I find is a terribly hard thing for me to do lately. Then, after I do this, then this is the merino wool. This is what it looks like, the fibers. This is what all of the pieces yeah. on this wall, this is what this is made from. But, but when she was talking yeah, about layering it, what you do is, you know, you, you have it this way, and then you take some more, and then you do it this, and then you lay it over this, you're sort of covering the whole thing, mm -hmm. and then you do it again, not get there, down there. So you have three layers. But people, you know, people look at my work, they don't know what I do. <laughs> and they, they find it very hard, but it usually ends up looking something like this. And then, what I do is, let's see, this is a piece, after this stage, this is what I call my mummy stage. <laughs> and this is when all this is all placed on here and it's all needle felting. I don't do any agitation or any water. So this piece has a full armature underneath. You'll be welcome to feel it when you come up here. But it's made, the, I mean, it's like a wire skeleton. This is something different. Each time I do a piece, I try to incorporate something new. So I'm, uh, it's a learning process for me as I go along. So there's the mummy stage. And I don't dye my fibers. If I had to dye the fibers, I would never get done. But you know, I, I have these wonderful colors. Here's some of the colors that I use. Mm -hmm. And I have this. Now, this is a piece I'm working on now. <clears throat> this is part of a series. It's called my elements, and this is this is the fire. This is really Pele from the uh, Hawaiian uh, tradition, and there's a story about her is that she came from Tahiti. I guess she had a spell, and her sister followed her because every place she went, she produced these volcanoes, and her sister came behind her to try and put them out. And then when she got to Hawaii. Finally, her sister killed her and released her from the spell. But that's the story of Pellet. So I'm working on this piece now. But you can see how, after I do the mummy stage, I start putting on all the colors. Now, the colors, the basic colors, I put on before I start all the embellishment, like you can see on, on Sweetie, those little dots in the face. Everything is done with fibers. I don't do any uh, paint or embroidery. I mean, people ch use chalks or you know, um, colored pencils, watercolors, but I use all fibers. So it's an awful lot of poking going on here. <laughs> so, but I do tend to work in series, but like I said, not consecutively. I'm doing something now. Besides this one, I have some, I, one of them is in here where it's a bird, but I have a couple other bird things that I'm working on. But something like this will probably end up taking about three and a half months to do. So it's, it's a lot of work, but I find it, uh, it just appeals to me. Don't ask me why, <laughs> but it is definitely not for someone who is in a, in a rush. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sitting in front of the computer is torture for me. So, but I can, but I can do this all day, and I do tend to stab myself. And then I know I need a break. <laughs> and these are, I'll show you the needles. The needles come in different sizes. But these are the needles that I use, and on the ends of these, there are little barbs, and some come so far and some are a little bit deeper, depending on what the process is you want, whether you're doing detail work or you're putting on or laying on fiber, the color. You know, this I tend to use a, a needle that has more barbs so that it penetrates and pulls the wool fibers together. But the detail work, I use a finer needle. 
and I, well, <coughs> I don't know, I sort of fell into this, but it's kind of like, uh, uh, I've gone full circle because I was talking to someone. I said, you know, when I was about three years old, I melted all my crayons and made things out of them. <laughs> of course, I didn't have any crayons for a while, and then I had to draw with a pencil before I had my crayons refurbished there. But the, uh, but the thing is, now I've gone back to sculpting. And when I was in college, I did take a sculpting course, but I didn't continue it, and my teacher was almost in tears because... I wanted to do printmaking and not sculpting, and he wanted me to do sculpting. So I'm doing sculpting now, <laughs> wherever you are, <laughs> but maybe not quite what you thought I was going to do. But I just, um, it just uh, intrigues me, and I, I find it relaxing. So uh, I don't know. It's, you know, life is funny. You just never know where you're going to end up. Somebody had told me this, you know. Fifteen years ago, I'd be doing this, and I would have thought they were crazy. Yeah. Mm. And I'm sure my husband would have thought so, too. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Thank you. My passion is shibori. <laughs> and I... Um, um, what is on display that uh, as you enter, and that's what I have. And the other, only other thing I have with me to show is what I'm wearing which is a um, harem pant that I did from um, this, this is using shibori techniques. And uh, what is shibori? It's, um, it's a Japanese word, and it's now it seems to be shibori is the term instead of tie-dyeing. Tie-dyeing is part of shibori. Shibori just, it's, it's, it's the main name, and under shibori you have so many different techniques that you use to create. You use, um, it's a way of manipulating the cloth, uh, folding, stitching, pleating, wrapping, clamping, pinching, um, using um, templates to create your, your, um, your idea, your pattern, folding it a certain way, using the templates, and dyeing the fabric. Myself, I became interested. I started out actually as a pattern maker, and I worked in the industry, the garment industry, for about 30 years. But always this need to create, to design. Now, pattern making is designing. You're the other part of the designer. The designer gives you the sketch, and then you create. So you're, she's one hand, and you're the other hand. And that's, a, that's how that works. That's how it works. But... I always wanted, also had this need to, to create and to design. So I started out with just actually buying uh, fabrics that were African uh, tie-dyed, but called pl plongy, and that's the term instead of tie-dyeing. And uh, fell in love with that and created different designs and so on. And then I learned that there were classes that I could actually take to learn how to create the fabric myself and once that happened it was that was it like I, I from then on I don't think I bought any fabric again except for the blank uh, we just started out I, I mainly work in silk and uh, I love silk because the first time I dyed the silk in the class it just a sort it just takes up the, the, the dye it just soaks up the dye and the colors are so brilliant depending on, of course, the dyes that you use. For me, it's a real process because I enjoy pattern making as well as just creating different types of fabric. So I start out with a design, I make the pattern. I, I, once my pattern is the way I want it to be, then I decide about how to apply it to the, uh, to the fabric. And the techniques are always shibori techniques. So, and that, um, that gives me a lot of pleasure, the process, each step you take. With the, um, one of the fa my favorite uh, techniques is uh, the Rashi Shibori, where you use poles to create. There's two ways of doing it. You could create something with pleating, which you, you'll see the scarves that I have there. They're pleated. Or you could actually pleat it and then press it out 
as I did with this, uh, what I'm wearing. I pressed them out and then I rewrapped it in an opposite direction and pleated it again. So this has been dyed and pleated. This was dyed, first dyed, uh, solid color, then um, pleated, dyed again, and then taken off the pole and then repleated it again. So it is a process depending on um, what you want to do and what you want to make. Generally, um, I use three yards at the most uh, um, for my scarves because I like the drama. I like you can wrap it around and really you know, feel good about yourself when you're wearing it. And that's also what I like about uh, the shibori because the different Whatever you, the different techniques gives you such um, a different look in the fabrics. So, um, uh, Shibori now has become somewhat popular. There's a woman, Yoshiko Wada, who has really brought uh, Shibori to the forefront. And she wrote the book on uh, the inventive art of Japanese shape resist dyeing. And uh, she has a website, uh, World Shibori Organization, and you can actually, uh, worldshibori.org. And um, she travels all over. She has conferences all over the world um, in reference to Shibori, where people all come together. I haven't been to any yet, <laughs> but that's on my agenda, my list. Um, and so this is my, my passion, my pleasure. There's so many techniques that I haven't even gotten to yet. I've been doing it for quite a while, but it, it is something that does, is a process and it does take time. You have to really begin to learn how to use your dyes, study your techniques and how they come out and try, because generally you don't always know what you're going to get. That's the beauty of resist dyeing also, because no matter how much you do the techniques, you, it's hard to control where water is going to take the dyes, water where it's going to take the, uh, the water and where it's, where it's going to go in the fabrics once you use the templates. I also use discharge dyeing, where some of my scarves, which has a very blurred look to it, and that also. And discharge dyeing is where you, with the template, you actually take color out. You've dyed it one time. You put your templates, which could be, uh, templates are wooden, I use wooden blocks a lot. And I have my uh, jigsaw where I actually create my own designs and cut them out. And that gives you your pattern that will come out onto your fabric when you dye it. You can remove the color, put another color in that's discharging, and then you get another complete look. So it's exciting. Shibori is something that it, it's never ending, I think. There's always something... Uh, a technique to use that maybe you haven't tried. So, um, so I really enjoy it. The pieces that I have out there, a lot of them are, are the, um, they call it itajime, and that's fold and clamp. And so some of them are, most of them are, they're fold and clamp. I have one that's the um, poncho, that is the turquoise one, and that is by just dying at one time because of the, it's an organza fabric. And is usually stiff, but it has what you call saracen in it, which is a gummy substance that the worm that's on the, um, the threads, generally they take this out and that makes the silk soft. But they leave it in for organza. But uh, Washiko, uh, Washiko, yeah, Washiko, she, Yoshi, Yoshiko, she developed this technique where you're able to use your template to resist a certain area of the fabric and you boil out all of the saracen. So when you undo it and you put it into the dye, you get two different, two different um, fibers, basically. One that still has the saracen in it, one without. And you dye it one time, and you get two different, two colors, not necessarily different colors, but the dye takes to the um, fabric differently. So these are all so many exciting things that I enjoy doing, and that's what you see on this one.